Okay, so in my previous lecture, I mentioned sort of I laid down the, the basic philosophy that uh, the arithmetic of an elliptic curve should be related in a rich variety of ways to periods of the corresponding uh, uh, modular form, and I wrote down a number of uh, uh, sort of uh, situations which I would like to, to approach. Now, at the end, I mentioned that the first order of business would be to uh, develop this uh, theory of complex periods attached to modular forms to extend that to the piadic setting. And so uh, we have the usual uh, complex analytic uh, uniformization, if we want, uh, of the complex points of E by a quotient, as a quotient of H modulo gamma naught of N, uh, coming from the modular parameterization that was explained in uh, Bas Edixhoven's uh, lecture last week. And what we want to do is uh, develop a, a piadic analog where we consider the quotient of the piadic upper half plane that I explained last time, modulo certain groups gamma, and we try to define certain modular parameterizations of the set of piadic points on the elliptic curve. Of course, I'll be making precise later what exactly is this group gamma. In fact, it's better to think about the, in this context, think of the de degree zero divisors on this piadic analytic quotient. So what I want to do um, now, of course, uh, I need to begin with some analytic preliminaries. Uh, to define cusp forms uh, of weight two on uh, H mod gamma naught of N, one defines these, of course, as being holomorphic functions on H, satisfying certain transformation properties. So the first question is, what is the analog of holomorphic functions on a, a piadic space like HP? Okay, so. That, it turns out, that the counterpart of this notion is what is uh, called rigid analytic functions. So, uh, it's, and of course, the theory of rigid analytic functions is not so widely known as is the theory of holomorphic functions. And so I'd like to begin by giving a sort of, uh, well, for some people, a review, uh, for others not, of what the basics that I'll be needing of the theory of rigid analysis. So the first uh, section of my lecture might be called rigid analysis, uh, the bare essentials. So I'm going to really only cover the features, I mean the, the elements of uh, rigid analysis that I need. So it's going to be a sort of very utilitarian approach, just what I need to develop the theory of piadic periods attached to, uh, uh, to, to, to elliptic curves. Okay, so um, well for holomorphic functions we say that a function is holomorphic if on every uh, in a neighborhood of every point, uh, for every sufficiently small disk around every point, this function has a nice expression as a power series. Um, and when we, once we made that definition, we realized that the, this notion of holomorphic on a connected domain is very rigid in the sense that uh, a holomorphic function is completely determined by its expansion in a neighborhood no matter how small of a, of a single point. Um, now, in rigid analysis, uh, sort of naive, I mean, naively you would think that the, the analog of an open disk would be an open piadic disk. So, but as we know, uh, uh, in the piadic topology, those uh, sets are not so well behaved. I mean, two piadic disks are either completely disjoint or one is contained in the other. So it's not reasonable to expect that one would have any nice principle of analytic continuation if we define a function, uh, if we define a notion of uh, piadic holomorphic function in terms of its behavior on such simple sets. So the first thing to do is to, uh, and this was, uh, these were all ideas that were introduced by Tate and Mumford, is to define an analytic structure on HP and in which the, basi in which the basic uh, sets are uh, not any more open in the disks, but things which are a little bit more complicated and which are called affinoids. And those are the things I want to describe now. So the sort of the, the, the type of subsets of HP which play the role of open disks in the theory of uh, rigid analysis are so-called affinoids. I'm going to begin by giving you a simple example, a sort of prototype of what an affinoid is. So we know that uh, because uh, P1 is a projective variety, if you want, there's a natural reduction map from the set of points uh, on P1 with coordinates in CP to the points in P1 with coordinates in FP bar, simply gotten by taking the coordinates and reducing them modulo a maximal ideal in the ring of integers of CP. Under this reduction map, 
which I'll call red, the, uh, of course, the points in P1, QP are mapped to uh, P1, FP, this finite subset of P1, FP bar. So one nice subset, which I'm going to call A0, that's going to be my first example of an affinoid, is the set of all tau in P1, CP, such that the reduction of tau does not belong to P1 of FP. Um, okay. And of course, this A0, uh, you'll observe, is contained in, is a nice subset of the piatic upper half plane, since I've removed all, uh, I've, so it's bas I've basically taken, I'll, here I'll draw you a picture of this basic affinoid A0, at least in the case where P equals 2. So it's really obtained by taking uh, P1 of CP and excising from that uh, P1 CP, P plus 1 open disks, open piatic disks, centered at the various residue classes of P1 of FP. So in the case P equals 2, I would have a 0 here, 1 there, and infinity somewhere out here, and my affinoid A0 would be this region here, which I'm shading. Now, it's convenient to somewhat thicken this affinoid by uh, adding to it certain open annuli, which are still subsets of HP, and which are defined. Uh, so here I'm going to give you, uh, again, just a basic example to begin. Uh, so I'm going to define WT to be the set of all taus such that um, the, abs the piatic absolute value of t minus tau is strictly between, between 1 and 1 over p. So I take, of course, here the normalized absolute value for which the absolute value of p is, is 1 over p. Now, uh, this is for t going z from 0, 1 up to p minus 1. And I'll define uh, the annulus w infinity to be the set of tau such that the absolute value of tau is between 1 and p. So you can think of these as uh, open annuli with uh, the residue classes 0, 1 up to p minus 1 in the center. And this is being an annulus with infinity somehow in the center. So let me illustrate this on the picture. So here is a0. And uh, here is uh, the annulus w0. Uh, okay. Here is uh, W1, and here, and, I, and the W infinity would be some kind of region like that. Okay, my, my picture is not so great, but so this is sort of the general appearance of uh, the affinoid and its uh, annuli, and its sort of associated annuli. So these, of course, are all sort of adjacent, if you want, to this, this basic affinoid. Uh, now, these sets, this A0 and this annulus, are going to be sort of the basic building blocks for a covering of HP. And you know that these are all, of course, contained in HP. They're all subsets of the piatic upper half plane. And we're going to somehow cover the piatic upper half plane by translating so these basic sets and define the rigid analytic structure in terms of the restriction of the function to these sets. So to define uh, the covering in a more general setting and to define more general affinoids, I'm going to, it's going to be useful actually to um, try to get a kind of combinatorial picture of how these various, th this basic set and its various translates by the action of PSL2QP intersect. We would like to get some kind of combinatorial uh, view of this. So for this, I introduce the tree. There's a combinatorial object, it's called, called the tree of uh, PGL2QP. And I'll call this uh, uh, script TP. So what it is, well, it's a graph. Exactly, well, it's a tree. I mean, uh, and so the vertices of this tree are indexed by homotopy classes of ZP lattices in the QP squared. So the vertices are just ZP lattices in QP squared modulo the uh, modulo homotopies, modulo the uh, dilations by QP star. 
And I have to tell you, of course, when two vertices are connected by an edge in this graph, in this tree. And uh, we say that uh, two vertices are connected uh, by an edge. So the edges consist of, um, well, so let me just say that uh, two vertices, uh, so two vertices v1 and v2 are adjacent if, well, if they're represented by lattices, so I, I v1 is corresponds to a homotopy class of lattices lambda 1 and v2 to a homotopy classes of lattices lambda 2, if I, I say I connect them by an edge, precisely if I can choose representatives for these homotopy classes of lattices in such a way that one, one lattice is containing the other with index p. So, so if I can choose these so that lambda 1 is contained in lambda 2, is contained in p, uh, oh, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> lambda 2 is contained in lambda 1, is contained in p lambda 1, like that, uh, where all these inclusions are strict inclusions. Okay? So that gives, us, that gives us the adjacency relation on the tree. Now, in the same way that we have a standard uh, affinoid, A0, um, sort of distinguished, an affinoid which has been distinguished by our choice of coordinate on P1CP, so to speak, we have a distinguished vertex on this tree, which, is the, which I'll call V0, which corresponds to the homotopy class of the standard ZP lattice, ZP squared in QP squared, so this I'll call the standard vertex on this uh, tree of, P, of PGL2QP. So standard vertex. And well, the edges, there are exactly P plus one edges which emanate from this vertex, which correspond to the sublattices of index P in ZP squared. But of course, those sublattices are a natural bijection with the lines in FP squared. Of course, you, that you, see, you can see that by reducing modulo p, which is canonically identified with p1 of fp. So I'll call, so the edges containing v0 are in a natural bijection. I, I emphasize that the bijection here is completely natural with p1 of fp. And so I'll label these edges E0, E1, E infinity. Okay, so you'll note that in this, so uh, I have here uh, annuli which are indexed by the same index set, P1 of FP, as are these basic edges coming out of this standard vertex. So now I can define what is often called the redu well, what is called the reduction map from HP to the tree TP. So um, the reduction, so maybe I should, this is a, more like a lemma slash definition. So there is a unique map, uh, which I'll call R, from HP to uh, T, from, to TP, uh, with the property um, oh, maybe I should say a bit more about this tree. I mean, the way I'm going to be uh, dealing with this tree is a in a very kind of um, uh, naive, uh, uh, down-to-earth way. I just think of the tree as being a purely combinatorial object consisting of a collection. So T is going to be, or TP is going to be T0 union T1, where T0 is the collection of vertices, namely homotopy classes of ZP lattices, and T1 is the collection of edges, and that's it. So, so I just view this as a, a collection of a disjoint union of two sets of, of, of vertices and edges. And uh, I'll also have use for the set E of TP, which are the set of ordered edges. Ordered edges, by which I mean just an ordered pair of vertices which are adjacent, which are connected by an edge. And uh, if E is such an ordered edge, sometimes I put an arrow there to emphasize the fact that I'm choosing an ordering, then I'll call S of E the source of this edge and T of E the target of, of the edge. 
Okay. So, so the definition lemma that I want to make is that there is a unique map from HP to TP um, such that satisfying the following conditions. Such that firstly, uh, R of tau is equal to the standard vertex V0 if and only if tau belongs to the basic affinoid A0, which I defined here, okay, this basic affinoid. And R of tau is equal to um, the edge uh, Ej, you know, I have these edges which are indexed by P1 of Fp, if and only if tau belongs to the annulus Wj. And then finally, the third property I need to completely determine this map R is that this map is equivariant under the action of PSL2QP. So I should of course note that PSL2QP acts naturally on HP by Mobius transformations, and it also acts naturally on the tree, of course, it, it, by its action on lattices, by its action on QP squared. Okay, so I'm going to, uh, the third property is that R of gamma tau is equal to R of tau for all gamma in PSL2. Uh, well, maybe, no, sorry, PGL2QP. PGL2QP. Okay, and it's not, it's an easy exercise to check that the first thing this map exists and it's unique. It's uniquely determined by these three properties. And uh, you can make a picture which is uh, sometimes useful to have in mind considering the structure of the piatic upper half plane. It sort of gives you an idea of. Um, oh, sorry. Um, absolutely. Thank you. Gamma R of tau. Yes. So, <laughs> sorry. Okay. So, um, yeah. So we can make a picture if you want. Uh, if you uh, again for p equals two. So uh, for p equals 2, you can think of uh, the affinoid A0 as being a region which looks a little bit like a, uh, a pair of pants, I mean in the case p equals uh, 2, with uh, this is sort of like a sphere with three open piatic disks removed. And then we have these annuli, I mean, we have these annuli that uh, we've added. I mean, which, uh, something like that. And this picture maps under R to the vertex of the tree of PGL2QP and the edges. And the tree is, of course, well, I mean, I should have mentioned this before. It's a homogeneous tree of uh, um, valency P plus 1 everywhere. So you should think of this basic picture, of course these things are all connected, I mean, uh, together, of this basic affinoid and these annuli as being sort of repeated uh, indefinitely over the tree. And these sets uh, form a good, I mean, a form a covering of HP by in, uh, piatic sets with a nice description. And it's in terms of those sets that we're going to define the region analytic structure on HP. So one can sometimes think of uh, the piatic upper half plane HP as being kind of a piatic tubular neighborhood of the tree TP, thanks to this description, which is illustrated in this picture. So um, now, having uh, done this, now let me uh, give a more a general, but not really completely general, definition of an affinoid. I'm going to uh, let E now, so if E is an edge of the tree T, I'm going to let the closed edge corresponding to E be the set consisting of E together with its source and target. So it's a set which contains one edge and two vertices. And the open edge uh, attached to E is going to be the uh, singleton consisting only of the edge E. And then uh, we can define the affinoid A sub E 
to be the inverse image under the reduction map of the closed edge attached to E. So you can see, I mean, uh, well, from this picture, you can sort of uh, imagine this is, this is actually two copies of, of the affinoid A0, or I mean, two, two translates of this basic affinoid A0 glued along an annulus, the annulus which reduces to the edge E. Uh, so, and then we also have uh, various annuli attached to open edges. So W sub E will denote the inverse image of the open edge E under the reduction map. And these are just translates of one of these basic annuli under the action of PGL2QP. So now, uh, having uh, sort of laid down, so we have now a covering, we have a covering of uh, HP by these Annual, uh, by, by these affinoids as E ranges over the edges of the tree and the combinatorics of the intersections of this cover are reflected in the incidence relations between the edges on the tree. So it's a sort of fairly simple combinatorics. For example, well, the tree has no homology. So you have this kind of simple combinatorial description of the covering by affinoids. So now, um, let me define what is a rigid analytic function on HP. Um, so uh, definition, uh, a CP valued function on HP is said to be rigid analytic Uh, if for all edges E in the set of edges of the tree, uh, the restriction of F to the affinoid A sub E is a uniform limit uh, well, limit of, uh, with respect to the soup norm with respect to the soup norm of rational functions having poles outside the affinoid AE. So if you can, on each affinoid, approximate your function uniformly on that affinoid in, in the soup norm by rational functions you say that the function is rigid analytic. So the role here of, of uh, power series, conversion power series, is being played by uh, rational functions. This is a little bit more uh, complicated, I mean, because we're taking you know, un uniform, uniform limits of rational functions. So, okay, so that's uh, what, the, the, so this is the notion which is going to play the role of holomorphic, the setting of piadic modular forms, or rigid analytic modular forms. Now I'm uh, in a, shape to uh, define modular forms of uh, weight k, I mean, on HP. Uh, well, for modular forms, you want to look typically at rigid analytic functions on HP, which satisfy suitable transformation properties under a suitable discrete subgroup of SL2QP. So I'm going to fix now, which choose a group gamma in SL2QP, and I'm going to assume that the gamma is a discrete subgroup of SL2QP, and that the quotient of um, HP by gamma is compact. So assume that HP mod gamma is compact in the piadic topology, which uh, implies that the tree, uh, the, the, the tree modulo, the quotient of uh, the tree by the group gamma is a finite graph. So I'll, I'll restrict myself to this kind of groups, which are the only ones that are going to appear later in applications. So uh, we say that, so now I can define modular forms. So um, a form of weight k on HP mod gamma is 
a rigid analytic function on HP. I mean, so it's exactly what you would expect. I mean, there's nothing. Uh, in fact, it's even easier than the definition of a for, uh, modular forms in the classical setting because we don't have to worry about cusps, about uh, behaviors at infinity since this quotient is already <coughs> compact. So is a rigid analytic function f from hp to cp, which transforms like a form of weight k under gamma. So f of gamma z equals cz plus d to the k f of z. For all gamma equals a, b, c, d in gamma, in the group gamma. So uh, we only care, well, okay, so this is the general notion of a form of weight k on HP mod gamma. Uh, in the applications related to elliptic curves, as in the complex setting, we only really care about forms of weight 2. Those are the ones that are going to correspond to uh, elliptic curves. So um, I'm going to just note so for forms of weight 2. Well, so if, uh, if f of z is a form of weight 2 on HP mod gamma, then we can write the uh, differential form omega f equals f of z dz. This is as I did in the last lecture for, uh, so this is now an invariant differential on HP mod gamma. So this is a differential on HP mod gamma. As in the last lecture, it's exactly the same uh, no notion, except that I'm not multiplying by 2 pi i, because in the piatic context, it's less clear what, what that is. So this is the associated differential on this uh, rigid analytic quotient, which, OK. So well, in my first lecture, I promised you that I wanted to talk about periods attached to such objects. And in order to do that, I have to have some notion of my, my periods that I presented, like modular symbols, Fintani cycles, and so on, of the first lecture, were defined by taking complex line integrals of the differential form attached to, to f. So I have to say something about what is the notion of piadic line integral in the, um, in the, in the piadic setting. So uh, in order to do that, I first want to give you a kind of more concrete description of forms of weight 2. So actually, I'll denote by S2 of HP mod gamma the space of forms of weight 2 on HP mod gamma. So that's something now I want to try to give you a, a concrete description of that. So for that, I'm going to need the notion that uh, was already introduced in this morning's lecture by Colmes of a piatic measure. So it's going to be actually it's exactly the same notion as the one he introduced. So a piatic measure well, the only difference in my, is that in my case the, 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 the domain on which this piatic measure is defined is a little bit different. In, in, in uh, Colmez's lecture, he talked about measures on ZP or ZP star. I'm going to introduce measures on P1QP. Aside from that, it's the same thing. So a piatic measure on P1QP is um, a finitely additive function um, mu from the set of all compact open subsets u of uh, P1QP to, um, to CP such that, um, well, so it's additive and, uh, so I said that already, I guess, yeah. And I have to introduce a boundedness condition, uh, a piatic boundedness condition on the measure that um, there exists, so such that, oh, I, yeah, I need two things actually. The, the first condition was also did not appear in Colmes's uh, presentation, but it's going to be very important for me. I'm going to re I need to require, this is a condition which appears a bit surprising at first sight, that the total measure 
of P1QP, the measure of the total space, should be zero. Of course, we're not talking about positive measures here, so this is not a, a problem. I mean, we can still have interesting objects with this property. And the second condition is that there exists a constant C, an absolute constant, such that uh, the piatic absolute value of U is bounded, of course, piatically, this is the piatic norm, by this constant for all compact open U in P1 QP. Okay. So it actually, the, the, the definition is also a little bit different from the one Cormes presented where he g gave a measure as being something which was dual to a certain space of functions on, uh, on the space. But it's actually uh, not hard to check that the two definitions are the same. They define the same class of objects. So I can uh, talk about integration against this measure in the sense of Cormes' lecture today. So this is not yet the piatic line integrals, which we're going to be introduced shortly. This is just integration of a measure. Um, so if lambda now is a function from P1QP on P1QP to CP, uh, which is continuous, then um, we define the integral on P1QP of lambda of t uh, d mu of t to be the obvious thing. I mean, we uh, can work with uh, Riemann sums if you want. We take the limit over finer and finer covers C equals U alpha, where the union of the disjoint union of the U alphas is P1 QP of uh, lambda of the sum over these alphas of lambda of T alpha uh, mu of U alpha, where T alpha is any sample point in U alpha. So this is just the Riemann's, the def the Riemann's definition of the integral. And uh, it shows how a measure, in my sense, gives rise to a linear function on the space of continuous functions on P1 QP. And that's what makes the bridge with Colmez's definition. So, so OK, if you have such, such a gadget, we can uh, integrate it against any uh, continuous function on P1 QP. That's what I'll be needing. Now, it turns out that, uh, yeah, I should have said, of course, that the limit here is taken over these covers, which are getting finer and finer, smaller and smaller radius, say. So there's an intimate connection between piatic measures on P1QP and rigid analytic uh, modular forms of weight 2 on HP. Uh, more precisely, um, um, let's see, so, so uh, from so from measures, I'm going to now explain to you how we can associate a cusp form uh, to a measure on P1QP. So from measures to forms in S2 of HP mod gamma. And this is going to give us a concrete description of forms of weight 2 on HP mod gamma, which is going to be very useful in, in various calculations. So uh, this is a... Well, in this case, it's a lemma. I mean, there's a general theorem of Teitelbaum, which is much more general than what I'm writing now, down now, uh, and which would certainly deserve to be called a theorem. But in the case that I'm, in the case of weight two that I'm interested in, this is actually very elementary and can be uh, proved really without any, uh, without much effort. So the dilemma is this: I suppose that uh, mu is a gamma invariant. Uh, measure on P1QP. So, of I mean, by gamma invariant, of course, I mean the obvious thing, that uh, mu of gamma u equals mu of u for all u and all gamma in gamma. So suppose this, um, then we can associate to this the following uh, function on HP. I, I define f sub mu of z, where z is a variable in HP, to be the integral over P1QP of uh, d mu of t over t minus z. So this is now a function of the variable z. And the, the, and the, the claim is that this is, belongs to the space of forms of weight 2 
on Hp mod gamma. Okay, and if you stare at this uh, lemma, I mean, you, you basically uh, it's, it's not hard to prove. Uh, you can see that this is, is a rigid analytic as a function of z by its very definition, by the very definition of the integral on p1 qp in terms of Riemann sums, you can see how this expression gives an approximation of f mu of z on any affinoid as a limit of rational functions, who, all of whose poles are contained in p1 qp, therefore uh, certainly outside any affinoid. And the fact that this expression, or rather f mu of z dz, is invariant under gamma follows by a direct calculation. In this direct calculation, one makes crucial use of the fact that the measure of P1QP is equal to zero. That's one place where I'm using that assumption. So this is a fun exercise to, um, to check that you really have uh, caught all my definitions. So there's also a way of going in the other direction. Uh, so if you have now a gamma invariant measure, you know how to produce a cusp form of weight 2, as, I mean, yeah, a modular form of weight 2 on HP mod gamma. We can also uh, reverse the process, so from measures, from forms to measures. Uh, so if uh, omega equals f of z dz is an invariant differential rigid analytic, of course, on HP mod gamma, then um, I'm going to show to you how to associate to omega a uh, measure on uh, P1 QP. So I do that by um, connecting uh, the, uh, the tree TP with um, uh, open sub, compact open subsets of P1 QP. So if E is an edge of, uh, belongs to the space set of edges of, of the tree, I can define T sub E to be a subtree, to be the largest, uh, well, connected subtree of, um, of TP, which contains E and no other edge with source of E as a vertex. Okay, so I think this is maybe more uh, readily conveyed by a picture than by this definition. I mean, if you have the tree of, um, let me draw the tree here for uh, the case where P equals 2. So the tree then is a, if P equals 2, it's a homogeneous tree of valency 3. So it looks something like that. And, uh, and if I have an edge, so if this edge E, uh, this ordered edge, then I look at the subtree, which contains source of E as sort of a root vertex and all the edges which emanate from that in this direction. So th this would be this kind of thing would be what I call T sub E. Okay. Now uh, we can define a region in the Piatic upper half plane by taking the inverse image under the reduction map of this tree, T sub E. So this is a region in the Piatic upper half plane, HP. And I can let uh, sigma E bar be the closure, be the closure of uh, sigma E in P1 CP. Okay, so now I look at the, the piatic topology on P1 CP and I take the closure of this region with respect to that topology. And then finally, I let U sub E be the intersection of P1 QP, which you can think of as the boundary of the piatic upper half plane uh, with um, uh, with this tree, with this, I mean, with, with this region, this, t, this um, what did I call it, sigma E bar. Okay, so the picture that you should have in mind, you saw that we thought of uh, the piatic upper half plane as being kind of a tubular neighborhood of this tree, where the deleted points, 
which are in bijection with P1 and QP, correspond to infinite n's of this tree. They're a natural bijection with the n's of this tree. So you can think of P1 and QP as being somehow the boundary at infinity I mean, of this tree. In other words, the set of all infinite edges, uh, infinite ends of the tree. This is P1 QP. And then uh, the, the region UE is the set of somehow of, you see, of, of um, limit point. I mean, the set of all ends which have E, which contain E and sort of go out from E like that, the set of all those ends uh, corresponds to a compact open subset of P1 QP, and that's what I call U sub E. And then uh, we can define, so I'm going to tell you what the measure attached to F is on one of these uh, open balls of the form U sub E for an edge of, uh, of the tree. So I define this to be, uh, maybe I should maybe I'll do this on the other board. So let's see. So mu, so definition, uh, I take mu f of the set ue to be the limit as j goes to infinity of the sum, uh, I'll tell you what, well, okay. so uh, the sum um, over all x in sigma e bar of the residue at x of fj of z dz, where fj of z dz is a sequence of rational differentials, these are rational forms, which converge to f uniformly on the affinoid a sub e. So I approximate f by rational functions. F for that, of course, I have a notion of residues. And the, of course, since these are rational functions, they have finitely many residues. And I take the sum on of the residues only at those points which belong to a sigma e bar, in other words, to the region in HP, or rather the closure of the region in HP, which maps to this subtree under the reduction map. And the residue theorem, the piatic residue theorem, that all residues of a, um, well, I mean, no, I mean, the, 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 the residue theorem for rational functions essentially implies that, um, that this uh, corresponding mu f is indeed a measure, satisfies the, the distribution relation implicit in the definition of a measure, the additivity property. So um, what uh, Schneider proved, but again, this is a, something which in, for in this context that I'm dealing with is very elementary and can be checked uh, completely explicitly and is a good exercise to work through. You have all the tools you need to, to, to work that out. Um, that, um, well, if we take, uh, so mu f is a gamma invariant measure on P1 QP and if I take the form f attached to mu f as in the previous construction taking this integral of 1 over z minus t against this measure I recover f okay I mean so in other words uh, yeah this, so this, this construction of Schneider in other words is really the reverse the the, the inverse map to the construction of tidal bomb that I gave earlier, which is associated to any measure of form of weight 2 on HP mod gamma. So to uh, summarize my discussion so far, I uh, have shown how regionalic forms of weight 2 on HP mod gamma are essentially equivalent. There's a sort of uh, very explicit dictionary between those objects and certain gamma invariant measures on P1 QP. So I'll let this I'll denote by this, the space of all measures on P1 QP with values in CP. I'll denote by this. Uh, and I'll put a gamma here to denote gamma invariant measures. Those things are in, uh, there's an isomorphism of CP vector spaces with the space of forms of weight 2 on HP mod gamma, which in this direction is gotten by taking the measure integrating against 1 over z minus t, and in that direction is gotten by taking a form and extracting its piatic residues around various affinoids. 
And uh, moreover, it emerges from the uh, discussion I gave here, I mean, how you define the measure. You can see that, of course, to, to describe a mu, I would have to tell you what, what mu of u is for every compact open set. But the compact opens of P1 and QP are finite unions of sets of the form u sub e. So really, I've described my measure completely when I've told you what is mu, mu of u sub e for every edge of the tree. And um, so in other words, it's encoded by a function on the edges of the tree with the property that if you take the function on adjacent edges, that sums to zero and so on and so forth. You have this sort of additivity property. So uh, this space of measures by a completely sort of uh, I mean elementary uh, description is, is, is in bijection, is in with the gamma invariant uh, harm, well, uh, functions uh, C from the space of oriented edges of TP to CP, which are harmonic. So the, the usual terminology for these functions is that they're harmonic. And what that means is simply that the sum over all the edges, all the ordered edges having a certain vert um, a certain uh, source, a fixed source V of F of C of E is equal to zero. And that C of E bar is equal to minus C of E, where e by E bar I mean the same edge but with the source and target interchanged, so with the orientation changed. So the, a function having these two properties, a function on the edges of the tree having these two properties, is called a harmonic function on uh, the tree. And these harmonic functions are nothing else. I mean, they're, they're in, in direct uh, bijection with the set of measures. Oh, uh, yeah, gamma invariant, of course. Harmonic functions are just correspond to measures on P1, QP, which are gamma invariant. So we have these three, ob with these three objects which are intimately connected to each other. Now, from this picture, we can immediately read off various nice facts about the structure of the space of... Uh, modular forms of weight 2 on HP mod gamma, okay? Uh, namely, uh, we have finite dimensionality. Of the space of forms uh, of weight 2 on HP mod gamma, in this case of compact quotient. Why is that? Well, these forms correspond to functions on the edges which are gamma invariant. But we saw before that uh, I was assuming that the TP mod gamma is a finite graph. So uh, of course this space is obviously finite dimensional. Okay, so because T mod gamma or TP mod gamma is finite. Uh, another thing which is nice and which I'm gonna have uh, use for later is an int a natural integral structure on S2 HP mod gamma. So I can define S2, uh, oh, sorry, S2 upper Z of HP mod gamma to be the set of forms such that the associated measure, or maybe perhaps even better, the associated gamma invariant harmonic function is actually Z valued and not just ZP valued. So this is just the set of all F such that this function, which I called C, maybe I should call it C sub F uh, uh, of E, belongs to Z for all E. So in other words, these are the functions whose piadic residues are not just uh, uh, piadic integral, or, you know, but actually integral, which really belong to Z. And this is a useful integral structure on the space of forms on HP mod gamma. Now I get to... Uh, I mean, the, the last topic, actually, of today's lecture, which is how to define the piadic line integrals attached to rigid analytic differentials on HP mod gamma. Well, uh, it's obvious what the general idea should be since we've defined a rigid analytic differential as being a limit, a uniform limit on any affinoid of, uh, of uh, rational differentials. We should just uh, understand how to differentiate, how to integrate, sorry, rational differentials and then pass to the limit somehow and extend by continuity. So uh, yadic line integrals uh, so, uh, so the basic idea is that we know or we can 
we can uh, guess, I guess, how to integrate rational differentials. Well, for a rational differential, I can break it up into its uh, uh, fractional parts. And I'm uh, reduced to understanding how to integrate. Um, so to, uh, I need to understand what is the integral from tau 1 to tau 2 of uh, dz over z minus a for some uh, for any a in uh, in uh, say in uh, well whatever I mean say a is in uh, yeah so okay I mean how how does one uh, what would be a natural definition of such a, an integral well uh, you would be tempted to just uh, say that this is the logarithm of tau two minus a over tau 1 minus a, which is, uh, of course, here we're in a piadic setting, so uh, we, should take the, we should take the piadic logarithm. So uh, here, so we just define this. This is sort of equal by definition. The piadic logarithm of tau 2 minus a over tau 1, over, so log is the piadic logarithm. In other words, it's a function it's a homomorphism, so that's somehow the condition which normalizes this. Because in the piadic context, because um, uh, yeah, because these regions are uh, totally disconnected, uh, functions can have many antiderivatives. On uh, um, but we normalize the, the definition of the integral in this way, where a log is a, is this is a homomorphism from CP star to CP. This is a particularly nice choice of uh, antiderivative of one over z minus a. Well, of course, this is not canonical either. We had, this depends on a choice. I mean, we have to uh, uh, choose. So this involves a choice of such a piadic logarithm. Uh, one sometimes calls this a branch of the piadic logarithm. Essentially, it amounts to choosing an element of CP star of uh, valuation strictly less than 1. Uh, something which is not a unit in CP star, and decreeing, so we have to choose a pi in CP star, which is not a unit, and decree that log of this pi is equal to zero. And that fixes the choice of the branch of the piadic logarithm. It's customary uh, to take pi to be equal to p, but there are other choices that are equally good, and in fact, for some of the later applications, will be led to make different choices for pi. So it's not always the best choice. So, but maybe let me just say sometimes we could take pi equals p. OK, so having done that, uh, we can now uh, extend this definition by continuity. So we extend by continuity to the rigid forms. So uh, this leads to the following definition. We define the integral from tau 1 to tau 2 of f of z dz to be the uh, integral uh, of p1 to p of the logarithm, this choice of piadic logarithm, of um, tau 2 minus t divided by tau 1 minus t against the measure d mu f, mu f of t associated to f. So this is my definition of the, of the piadic line integral from tau 1 to tau 2. And this definition can be justified, if you want, by the formal calculation that um, from this uh, uh, construction of Teitelbaum associating to a measure a form, we can rewrite this as the integral from tau 1 to tau 2 integral from over p1 qp of uh, d mu f of t over z minus t. And then we interchange the order of the uh, integration, which is implicit in my uh, you know, saying that we want to uh, extend this definition of the line integral by continuity to rigid analytic uh, forms. So interchanging the order, we have integral over p1 qp of integral from tau 1 to tau 2. Uh, sorry, this is mu f of t, z minus t, uh, dz, yeah? Because, and uh, so integral from tau 1 to tau 2 of dz over z minus t, d mu f of t. And of course, 
this is an expression that I know how to integrate. It's a very simple, rational, differential form. And I get this, immediately I get this expression. So this is the formal calculation which justifies my definition of the piadic line integral in this context. So, um, So what's in the box at the end of the day is a definition. Yes. And so this was sort of my attempt to justify the definition. So, uh, okay. So that's, based, that's almost it for today. Um, I just want to make one uh, last uh, comment that in, the, in this context where we have a group gamma which acts on HP with compact quotient, as we saw, we had this kind of nice uh, integral structure on the forms on HP mod gamma. And uh, one thing which is not so nice about this piadic line integral is that it depends on this choice of piadic logarithm, which makes it not so. So it's tempting to try to formally exponentiate that expression. And that's something that is possible to do, at least in the case where we have uh, a form uh, which belongs to this uh, space which I called S2 of HP mod gamma Z, the space of forms with uh, Z-valued associated measures. So I'm going to now talk about multiplicative integrals. So um, if F belongs to S2 of HP mod gamma with associated Z-valued measure, then we may set, so I'm going to introduce the following uh, symbol for this. I, I call it an integral with a little cross in the middle. So from tau 1 to tau 2 of f of z dz. So this is, I, I define to be the multiplicative integral of p1 q over p1qp of, uh, well, what I would get by exponentiating this, namely tau 2 minus t over tau 2 minus, uh, over tau 1 minus t, uh, d mu f of t. So of course I have to tell you what I mean by this multiplicative integral. Uh, what I mean exactly is that what you would think, namely I replace the usual definition of an integral over p1 qp as a limit of Riemann sums by the corresponding limit of Riemann products, where I just take limits of products instead of sums. I mean you can define, uh, so this is just the limit over all covers finer and finer of p1 qp, covers of p1 qp, of uh, uh, tau 2 minus t alpha divided by tau 1 minus t alpha to the power mu f of u alpha. And you see, this is where I need the fact that these mu f of u alphas are z or belong to z. Otherwise, I, would, I don't know what it means to take a a piadic number in CP star and raise it to the power of a piadic number. So this is, is where the integrality really comes in. And this is an, naturally an element in CP star. Now this is a bit more pleasant for various applications to work with than, the, um, than this uh, additive integral because, well, it doesn't, it doesn't require the choice of a piadic algorithm, and it carries a bit more information. It has a bit more structure. Uh, in particular, uh, you'll note that it's related in the following way, tau 1 to tau 2. Uh, you recover the usual integral by taking the logarithm of this one, of course. But because the logarithm is not injective, for example, it's, it vanishes on torsion, this uh, expression here uh, is an invariant which is finer and which carries a more information. So that's why sometimes it's useful to work with the multiplicative integral. And we'll also see one reason why this uh, appears uh, is, is more pleasant to work with is that because this belongs to CP star, and later on we're going to be considering these periods, and we're going to be mapping them to the elliptic curve using the Tate uniformization, which is a map from CP star to E of CP. And you know very well that to generalize the Weierstrass theory of complex uniformization of elliptic curves, uh, it's better to work with the, the multiplicative group of CP and not the additive group. And so uh, this is why having, uh, being able to define periods which are multiplicative is better for our, our later applications. Okay, so this uh, completes today's lecture, which uh, 
as you saw, was purely local, purely piatic analytic. So in the next lecture, what I'm going to do is explain the kind of piatic analog, I mean, uh, but it's still, a, this is going to, be, uh, going to be a global theorem, which to every elliptic curve over the rational, or to elliptic curves over the rational satisfying suitable assumptions, we're going to associate to such curves certain groups gamma acting discreetly on HP, which are arithmetic, and uh, also certain rigid analytic forms of weight two on HP mod gamma, which are associated to E very much as in the, case, the, the classical case of, uh, of uh, HP, H mod gamma not of N. And then uh, we're gonna use these line integrals to define piatic analogs of the complex uniformizations for the thick curves. And then uh, using these omega s, we're gonna be able to define all kinds of piatic analogs of the periods, which I described last time in the Archimedean context and uh, we'll use those then to define piatic L functions in state and prove various properties about them. So that'll be lecture three. Okay, thank you.